Hello class, good day. For this lesson, lesson 2, we shall study the origin of modern astronomy. So in this lesson, we will travel back in time and we will trace the beginnings of modern astronomy. So we will start our journey during the prehistoric times and we will see how our ancestors have gazed upon the heavens. So come on, come with me and let us now journey, let us travel back in time during the prehistoric period. So beam me up, Scotty. I said beam me up. Okay, energize. So in this lecture, we will trace the beginnings of modern astronomy. And we will start our journey way, way back during prehistoric times. So for tens of thousands of years, our ancestors, they have started looking up in the night sky and they were fascinated by what they saw. They saw stars, they saw the moon, and they were fascinated by these observations of the sky. And our ancestors, they also noticed certain patterns of stars in the sky. And these patterns of stars, they looked like animals and people. And because of their amazement and fascination of these patterns of stars, they made up stories about what they observed. Alright, and they noticed that the moon also changed shape from night to night. And also they noticed that the moon changes position among the background of stars. So they started observing the night sky. And probably they made records of what they have observed. In fact, the oldest records we have of these ancient astronomical observations are the 30,000 year old paintings found on the walls of caves. So here is an example of uh, an ancient cave painting made by our prehistoric ancestors. So we have here a painting of a prehistoric ox or cattle and in the background you will notice dots Okay, and probably those dots, they represent constellations or these patterns of stars in the night sky. And they were fascinated by it, so they made these uh, cave paintings. Alright, and in this picture, if you will notice, look at the head of this uh, prehistoric cattle. You will notice that there are dots. And probably, if you will just analyze the pattern... They resemble the constellation Taurus. And in front of the cattle, you will notice three dots. And probably those three dots, they represent the Orion's belt. And uh, just above the uh, painting of the ox, you will notice those patterns of stars. And probably they represent the constellation Pleiades. Fascinating, isn't it? Fascinating. 
Amazing, really. So, some of the world's oldest cave paintings have revealed how ancient people had relatively advanced knowledge of astronomy. So, our ancestors, they started looking up and out of their fascination and amazement of what they have saw in the night sky, they made these cave paintings. So, this would reveal that they have some advanced knowledge of astronomy. Fascinating, isn't it? Alright, so those were the cave paintings made by our ancient ancestors. And again, these cave paintings revealed that our ancient ancestors, they had relatively advanced knowledge of the heavens. And because of their fascination and uh, their amazement of what they saw in the night sky, they associated their astronomical observations with religion, with their gods and spirits. So that's what they did. They associated these astronomical observations with their gods and spirits. So these early cultures, they identify these celestial objects with religion, with their gods and spirits. And also, they related these astronomical objects to natural phenomena such as rain, drought, seasons, and tides. Fascinating. You will notice that our ancestors, they place so much importance to observing the night sky because they associated them with their gods and spirits and these astronomical objects were associated with their daily activities. So you can see now the importance of tracking accurately the movements of these celestial objects. So, what our ancestors did in order to track accurately the movements of the sun, the moon, and the stars, they started erecting large stones. So, our ancestors at around 5,000 years ago, they set up large stones to mark the movement of the sun and the other heavenly bodies. So, one good example of this is Stonehenge and by tracking the movement of the heavenly bodies these first astronomers have created calendars based from what they observe in the movement of the moon all right so one good example of an ancient observatory is Stonehenge all right, so this is Stonehenge in uh, UK, United Kingdom, in England. And uh, this ancient observatory uh, was also a place of worship. So you can see now the stones that were erected. And these stones were aligned to certain stars. Stonehenge was constructed at around 3000 to 1800 BC. Okay? And uh, the stones that were erected were aligned to certain stars in the night sky. And using Stonehenge, they were able to track the sun and the movement of the stars. So with that, they were able to record sunset, sunrise, moonset moonrise and they were able to predict winter and summer solstices amazing fascinating isn't it fascinating. and using stonehenge our primitive ancestors probably they were able to came up with a calendar using stonehenge all right so that's stonehenge an ancient observatory and also a place of worship because our ancestors have associated their astronomical observations with religion, with their gods and goddesses. 
Now to further understand and appreciate the role of Stonehenge to the development of modern astronomy, let's watch this fascinating video about Stonehenge. The Stonehenge in England, we have this alignment of sacred sites towards both the sun and the moon. The monument is actually located at 51 degrees latitude. And the significance of this is that the moon on its 18.61 year cycle is exactly 90 degrees away from the rising of the sun at the time of the winter solstice. So it makes an exact right angled shape. And this is very, very significant because this could only take place at this latitude, which suggests that the positioning of Stonehenge was very, very important. At Stonehenge, which we can regard as an astronomical observatory, we can measure and calculate the Earth's equinoxes and the winter and summer solstices. But we can even calculate eclipses using the layout of the stones at Stonehenge. It's very fascinating that looking at the construction and how they evolve over time, and they keep doing so not just based on one particular design facet, they keep repeating the same design feature, the same construction method, the same unit of measure over time. The original sockets of Stonehenge, which you can now no longer see, uh, they are 8000 BC. Uh, eventually the temple has to shift according to the background of stars so then those blue stones are moved to the center which is today the blue stone circle of Stonehenge. In 2600 BC the stars have again moved so now they've added the sarsen stones, the big stones. So you see how the temple keeps moving, reshaping and adapting itself to the heavens. Many many things have been uncovered at Stonehenge that suggest that an incredible culture at some point existed there. Now this requires two things. One is planning and the other one is writing. Now if we were to subscribe to what mainstream archaeology suggests, then at that time our ancestors possessed neither. And all of a sudden we are building massive stone structures like Stonehenge that are aerial models of our solar system and the question arises, where did this knowledge come from? All right, so that's Stonehenge. Stonehenge is an astronomical ancient observatory. And at the same time, Stonehenge is a place of worship. So you could see here that our ancestors have associated uh, the observations of the heavens with religion. Okay, so another example of an ancient observatory is the Bighorn Medicine Wheel in the United States. So if you will notice the Bighorn Medicine Wheel, uh, the markings on the ground resemble the spokes of a wheel. And those markings on the ground are actually aligned to certain stars okay like Aldebaran, Rigel, Sirius and the uh, big horn medicine wheel was used to mark the movements of the sun the moon and the stars they made use of the big horn medicine wheel to predict winter and summer solstices fascinating isn't it all right, so that's the big horn medicine wheel in the United States. Now, another example of an ancient observatory was made by the Mayan civilization at around 1000 AD, the so-called Caracol, made by the Mayan culture. Now, the Caracol was an astronomical observatory Okay, it was made to track the movements of the heavenly bodies and the caracol also was made to worship their gods. So that was the Mayan civilization and that's the caracol which is an ancient observatory. Alright, so these astronomical observatories like Stonehenge 
the Bighorn Medicine Wheel and the Kakakol, they were constructed because our ancient ancestors, they associated the study of the heavens with religion. And again, they associated the movements of the stars, the moon, and the sun with natural phenomena. So really, the study of the heavens was considered really important to our ancient ancestors. That's why they constructed these astronomical observatories. Now, the uh, Mesopotamians also considered astronomy a huge part of their culture. Astronomy was a huge part of the Mesopotamian civilization. So, it was the priest who studied the heavens. And uh, with their knowledge of astronomy, they came up with a 12-month calendar based on the movements of the moon. And also the priest, the Mesopotamian priest, they also predicted winter and summer solstices. They predicted also eclipses. And they were able to come up with some astronomical tables. They amass astronomical data. Fantastic, isn't it? How fascinating is the word I use for the unexpected. Now, the Mesopotamians also constructed observatories. Their observatories are in the form of ziggurats that was constructed at about 6,000 years ago. And if you look at the illustration of a ziggurat, a ziggurat resembles that of the pyramids of the ancient Egyptians. Now, a ziggurat has seven levels if you will take a look at the illustration. And a level is dedicated to a particular wandering object in the sky. Like for example, the first level is dedicated to the sun. The second level is dedicated to the moon. The third level is dedicated to Mercury, then followed by Venus, then followed by Mars, Jupiter. And the last level is dedicated to Saturn. Alright? And these seven levels, they represent the seven days of the week. Okay, so that was made by the Mesopotamians. Okay, so uh, the seven-day week was made by the Mesopotamians. Okay, so if you will take a look at this uh, illustration of the seven days of the week, each day is dedicated to a particular wandering object in the sky. Like for example, Sunday. Now, Sunday is dedicated to, obviously, the sun or soul. Alright? Then, look at Monday. Monday is dedicated to, obviously, the moon. Luna. Moon day. Moon day. Now, everybody look at Tuesday. Now, Tuesday is dedicated to the god Tiu, which is equivalent to Mars. So, that's why we have Tuesday. Tuesday. Then, everybody look at Wednesday. Wednesday is dedicated to the god Woden, which is equivalent to Mercury. So, Woden's Day. Woden's Day. Wednesday. Then, everybody look at Thursday. Thursday is dedicated to Thor. I'm sure you know Thor. Okay, which is equivalent to Jupiter. So, that's why we have Thor's Day. Thursday. Then, look at Friday. Friday is dedicated to the god Frigg, Frida, which is equivalent to Venus. That's why we have Frida, Friday. Fantastic, isn't it? Fascinating. And Saturday, look at Saturday. Saturday is dedicated to Saturn. Saturnus, Saturday. Okay, so this was made by the Mesopotamians. So the Mesopotamians came up with this seven day a week uh, calendar. Fascinating, isn't it? 
So using their ziggurats, the Mesopotamians came up with the seven days in a week. So each day uh, was dedicated to a particular wandering object in the sky. All right. So here is an illustration of a ziggurat with those seven levels. Again, each level of the ziggurat is dedicated to a particular wandering object in the sky. Okay. Also, the Mesopotamians, they used the ziggurat to track the movement of the stars. And they came up also with their own constellations. Okay. And they use these uh, constellations so that they can determine their planting and harvesting periods. So what I'm trying to say is that the uh, Mesopotamians, they believe that these stars can influence their daily activities, especially planting and harvesting activities. So they came up with the Zodiac. So the Zodiac was made by the Mesopotamians. Alright? Fascinating, isn't it? Okay? The Mesopotamians also divided circles in 360 degrees, which we still use, and they recorded their observations in cuneiform. Alright? So that was the astronomy of the Mesopotamians. Okay, class. So, before we continue, Let's watch this fascinating video about the Mesopotamians and how they contributed to the development of astronomy. So let's watch this. The story of writing, astronomy, and law. The story of civilization itself begins in one place. Not Egypt. Not Greece, not Rome, but Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is an exceedingly fertile plain situated between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. For five millennia, this small strip of land situated in what is today Iraq, Kuwait, and Syria fostered innovations that would change the world forever. Inhabited for nearly 12,000 years, Mesopotamia's stable climate, rich soil, and steady supply of fresh water made it ideal for agriculture to develop and thrive. About 6,000 years ago, seemingly overnight, some of these agricultural settlements blossomed into some of the world's first cities. In the period between 4,000 and 3,100 BC, Mesopotamia was dotted with a constellation of competing city-states. At one point, they were unified under the Akkadian Empire and then broke apart, forming the empires of Assyria and Babylon. Despite near-constant warfare, innovation and development thrived in ancient Mesopotamia. They built on a monumental scale, from palaces to ziggurats. Mammoth temples served as ritual locations to commune with the gods. They also developed advanced mathematics, including a base 60 system that created a 60-second minute, a 60-minute hour, and a 360-degree circular angle. The Babylonians used their sophisticated system of mathematics to map and study the sky. They divided one Earth year into 12 periods. Each was named after the most prominent constellations in the heavens, a tradition later adopted by the Greeks to create the Zodiac. They also divided the week into seven days, naming each after their seven gods embodied by the seven observable planets in the sky. But perhaps the most impactful innovation to come out of Mesopotamia is literacy. What began as simple pictures scrawled onto wet clay to keep track of goods and wealth developed into a sophisticated writing system by the year 3200 BC. This writing system would come to be called cuneiform in modern times and proved so flexible that, over the span of 3,000 years, it would be adapted for over a dozen different major languages and countless uses, including recording the law of the Babylonian king Hammurabi, 
which formed the basis of a standardized justice system. But Mesopotamia's success became its undoing. Babylon, in particular, proved too rich a state to resist outside envy. In 539 BC, the Persian king Cyrus conquered Babylon and sealed his control over the entirety of Mesopotamia. For centuries, this area became a territory of foreign empires. Eventually, Mesopotamia would fade, like its kings, into the mist of history, and its cities would sink beneath the sands of Iraq. But its ideas would prevail in literacy, law, math, astronomy, and the gift of civilization itself. Okay, so just like the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians also associated the study of the heavens with religion. Now, the Egyptians, they believed that many of the stars and the planets were actually gods and goddesses that they worship. So, similar to the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians also associated the study of the heavens with religion. In fact, they were drawn to two bright stars that always could be seen circling the North Pole. And the Egyptians referred to those stars as the indestructibles. So these two bright stars are the following. We have Kochab in the bowl of the Little Dipper or Ursa Minor. And Mizar are located in the middle of the handle of the Big Dipper or Ursa Major. Okay. So here's uh, a simple illustration to help us locate these two bright stars in the northern hemisphere. So this is Mizar. Mizar is located at the middle of the handle of the Big Dipper. And this is Kochab, located in the bowl of the Little Dipper. Okay, so again, this is Kochab at the bowl of the Little Dipper. And this is Mizar. Mizar is located in the middle of the handle of the Big Dipper. And right over here, just follow my cursor, this is the North Star or Polaris. Okay. Alright, so those are the so-called indestructible stars located in the Northern Hemisphere. All right. Now, the Egyptian civilization is anchored on agriculture. Agriculture was the foundation of the ancient Egyptian civilization, so water is vital. And the source of water for agriculture is the Nile River. And the Nile River is affected by the lunar tides. So there are times in the year that flooding occurs along the Nile River. So it is important for the Egyptian farmer to predict the occurrence of flooding along the Nile River. Okay, so the annual flooding of the Nile was the foundation of Egyptian civilization and agriculture. So it is vital for the ancient Egyptians to predict the occurrence of this flooding with accuracy. And this became the driving force behind the development of Egyptian astronomy. Fascinating, isn't it? Fascinating. And again, like what I have mentioned, the Egyptians studied the heavens and they associated the study of the heavens with religion. Alright, that was really fascinating indeed. So the prediction of flooding along the Nile River became vital for the Egyptian farmer. And this became the driving force behind the development of Egyptian astronomy. Okay? And not only that, when we speak of Egyptians, we think of the pyramids. And the Egyptians, they constructed their pyramids in such a way that they align 
their pyramids and even their temples towards the north. Why? Because they believed that their pharaohs would become stars in the northern sky after they died. So as you could see here that the Egyptians, they associated even architecture with religion and in the study of the heavens. Alright, so the precise orientation of the Egyptian pyramids affords a lasting demonstration of the high degree of technical skill in watching the heavens. It has been shown that the pyramids were aligned towards the pole star. Now at that time, ladies and gentlemen, the pole star was Tuban, not Polaris. Now Tuban is a faint star in the constellation of Draco or Draco. Alright, so as you could see here, see the uh, orientation of the pyramids. They were aligned at Tuban, okay, which is then the pole star during that time, okay? Alright, so as you could see here in this diagram, so look at the burial chamber of the pyramid. So the burial chamber is oriented to Tuban in the north. Tuban was the pole star during the time of the ancient Egyptians. And opposite of that, the pyramids, they were oriented to the Orion's belt. So as you could see here, even in the construction of the pyramids, the Egyptians, they have to study the heavens because the pyramids, they were constructed to be aligned to certain stars like Tuban and the stars along the Orion's belt. So here's another illustration of how the pyramids were aligned to certain stars. Like again, during the time of the ancient Egyptians, the polar star or the celestial pole star was Tuban in the constellation Draco, as you could see in this illustration. Okay, not Polaris, but it was Tuban. Okay, then... Now, opposite of that, we have the uh, stars along the Orion's belt and even Sirius. Okay, so just look at the burial chamber of the pyramid. So, the burial chamber was aligned to those stars. Tuban in the constellation Draco and the three stars of the Orion's belt and including Sirius. Okay fascinating isn't it all right so you could see here now the shift from uh, tuban to polaris so at present we have polaris as our pole star but during the time of the egyptians at around 2000 bc it was tuban okay the, they considered tuban as the pole star okay so isn't that fascinating now everybody i want you to focus on the next slide and you will find this really fascinating and you will find this very intriguing and you might think that some form of alien intervention might have occurred in the construction of the pyramids now the pyramids were located to reflect the constellation orion and look at the pyramids at Giza. Those three pyramids at Giza, they represent the belt of Orion. Alright? So I want you now to zoom in on the following. So we have here the three pyramids at Giza. And we have here the three stars of the Orion's belt. So the pyramids at Giza are somewhat associated with the three stars along the Orion's belt. Alright? So, isn't that fascinating really? Okay, and how the Egyptians associated even the construction of the pyramids with the study of the heavens. Alright? 
So here is an aerial photo of the pyramids at Giza. Okay, so you can see here the pyramids of Giza and we have here the three stars of the Orion's belt. So the pyramids here at Giza, they somehow represent the three stars at the Orion's belt. Okay, so I'm really intrigued by that. So you might think there's there's some form of alien intervention here. Okay, so that's how the Egyptians studied the heavens and how they associate the study of the heavens in the construction of their pyramids. Okay. All right, class. So do you find that fascinating and intriguing? The fact that the ancient Egyptians might have received some form of alien intervention in the construction of the pyramids all right so we really don't know but uh, to further appreciate what the egyptians had contributed to the development of modern astronomy let's watch this amazing and fascinating video about the ancient egyptians so let's watch this the ancient Egyptian civilization lasted for over 3,000 years and became one of the most powerful and iconic civilizations in history. At its height, ancient Egypt's empire stretched as far north as modern-day Syria and as far south as today's Sudan. But long before it was an empire, ancient Egypt was a series of small, independent city-states that bloomed along North Africa's Nile River. The city-states were divided into two regions and named according to the flow of the Nile, Upper Egypt in the south, which was upstream, and Lower Egypt in the north, which was downstream. By about 3100 BC, the two halves united, thereby creating one Egyptian state that lasted for millennia. The reign of this civilization can be divided into three major periods of prosperity, called the Old, Middle, and New Kingdoms, and two periods of instability in between, called the First and Second Intermediate Periods. Guiding the Egyptian people was a succession of about 300 rulers, often referred to as pharaohs. Pharaoh, which means great house in Egyptian, was never the ruler's formal title. It only became synonymous with the ruling individual in modern times, thanks to its use in the Hebrew Bible. These rulers, who were not always men, nor Egyptian, were considered protectors of the people and served as divine liaisons between humanity and the hundreds of gods they worshipped. After the rulers passed away, ancient Egyptians believed they then became gods. To prepare their journey into the afterlife, the rulers constructed elaborate tombs, including the Great Pyramids at Giza, and underground mausoleums in the Valley of the Kings. Rulers filled their tombs with all the items they could need in the afterlife, including gold, jewelry, food, drink, and even pets. Preparing for this journey to the gods also involved mummifying one's body. The deceased's corpse was embalmed, wrapped in hundreds of yards of linen, and placed inside the tomb so the body could be reanimated in the afterlife. To this day, structures like the Great Pyramids are a testament to the role of religion in ancient Egyptians' lives. But they also represent the innovative and cultural might of the Egyptian people. Innovations in mathematics and written language in particular propelled their civilization to success. Math, specifically measurement mathematics, helped Egyptians understand and harness their world with numbers like no other civilization had before. They developed a new form of measurement called the cubit. It was used to design massive structures, such as the Great Pyramid, with remarkable geometrical precision. The Egyptians also measured time. By combining mathematics with astronomy, they established a 24-hour division to the day and created a solar calendar, 
which was the first dating system in history to feature 365 days in one year. Lastly, Egyptians developed methods to measure and survey land around the Nile River. These civil engineering feats made way for the construction of dams, canals, and irrigation systems that helped farming and agriculture to flourish in the Nile Valley. In addition to mathematical concepts, the ancient Egyptians also created written languages to describe the world around them. The oldest and probably most well-known of these is hieroglyphic writing. This system was developed around 3150 BC during the Old Kingdom and has over 700 pictorial characters. It was used to inscribe monuments and pottery and predominantly served a decorative or ceremonial purpose. Soon after, another ancient form of writing, called hieratic, developed out of the hieroglyphic system. It was a form of cursive that was written in ink and served a more functional purpose. Unlike its more formal predecessor, hieratic was written on another ancient Egyptian innovation, papyrus. Papyrus was a type of paper derived from the papyrus plant, which grew plentifully along the Nile River. This medium gave the ancient Egyptians a new avenue of communication and record keeping that allowed their civilization's administrative skill to grow and their culture to spread for thousands of years. As with all great empires, ancient Egypt came to an end. It was eventually conquered after a series of invasions, including those by the Persian Empire in the 4th century BC and the Roman Empire around 30 BC. Not many civilizations can claim a lifespan of over 3,000 years, let alone one that made vast cultural contributions that still resonate in modern times. Ancient Egypt, with its linguistic and mathematical innovations, spirituality and religion, and extensive political and military might set a high standard for all civilizations that followed. The measurements of the length and width of the perimeter of the Great Pyramid correspond to an exact fraction of both the latitude and longitude measurements at the equator. Scaled up, this means the Great Pyramid directly corresponds to the circumference of the equator as well as the measurement from the equator to the pole, making it a scale model of the Northern Hemisphere. Recently, using satellite technology, researchers have realized yet another advanced formula encoded in the design. If you take the location of the Great Pyramid as a coordinate, this number sequence of this coordinate matches exactly the speed of light traveling through space measured in meters per second. This is amazing stuff. When you consider the vast amount of information about the Earth that's encoded into the Great Pyramid, you can't just dismiss all of this as pure coincidence. Although the Great Pyramid at Giza offers an astounding example of encoded information, other sites around the world, such as the Mesoamerican Pyramids and the Ziggurats of Mesopotamia, have also been found to be aligned to exact cardinal points and embody mathematical concepts. These buildings were built under divine guidance. This is a mark of the gods. They put certain things in these buildings to let us know they are not entirely of human origin. They represent something larger than we are. The builders wanted to make sure that a future generation would know that there's a discrepancy in knowledge. And what I'm suggesting is that all these ancient structures are calling cards left by extraterrestrials. Ancient astronaut theorists suggest that evidence of extraterrestrial intervention in the construction and placement of these incredible structures can also be found by examining their alignments with the stars. If I wanted to leave behind a piece of evidence that suggests where I'm from, 
One way, for example, is by creating monuments that are in the shape of constellations. In ancient Egypt, the three pyramids are aligned with the constellation of Orion's belt. The pyramids are not the only monuments that have this particular configuration. The ancient site of Teotihuacan in Mexico also contains three pyramids that are oriented to match up with the belt stars of Orion. And other sites throughout the world have been found to have similar astronomical alignments. Now, to summarize this part of the lesson about prehistoric astronomy or ancient astronomy, now we have to consider the following. Now, the basis of prehistoric astronomy are as follows. Now, our ancestors, they started looking up at the night sky and they started observing and recording the rising and setting of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Then our ancestors, as they looked up, they saw certain patterns of stars in the night sky. And we call them now as constellations. And our ancestors, they believed that these constellations may influence their daily lives. Also, our ancestors, they started observing and recording the annual motion of the sun, the motion of the planets through the zodiac, they also recorded the phases of the moon and using those ancient astronomical observatories like Stonehenge and the Caracol, they were able to predict eclipses. Uh, they also predicted summer and winter solstice. So that's prehistoric astronomy.